A couple of months ago I said I will try reviewing more interesting cars and here we have something very interesting indeed. It's called Range Rover Velar. It costs about 120,000 euro and it looks like a glorified station wagon. I wonder what justifies the high price tag. A couple of days with the Velar and I can say first impressions are not always right. At first proportions may look a bit off for a Range Rover, but that's because of pneumatic suspension, standard for V6 models. Turn the car off and the suspension lowers, giving you easier access. At normal ride height, Velar still isn't particularly high, but it no longer looks like an off-road estate. What is the Velar anyway? Size-wise, the new Range Rover falls somewhere between BMW X3 and X5. As for the name, Velar is a codename Rover used in late 1960s for pre-production Range Rovers. A couple of dozen were made before the car debuted in 1970. Using the Velar name half a century later is a cool reference to the brand's heritage. But history is history and new Range Rover Velar is thoroughly modern, even if Tesla-like door handles are an overkill in my opinion. In a Tesla, it's enough you approach the car for the handles to automatically slide out. Here, you either have to use a remote control or press a button on the door handle itself. Well, I guess there is some wow factor to it, right? But what if the battery dies? Fear not, because there is analog access to an analog keyhole, like so. Unless, of course, you left the car for the night in freezing temperature and snow, then good luck heating these with a lighter. However, the door handles are just a taste of what modern stuff you'll find inside. We've seen cars with two displays, but Range Rover Velar has three. The screen in front of the driver displays traditional dials, digital dials, maps, and a lot of other stuff which I'm afraid to show you because I won't be able to go back to my favorite setting. I yet have to master the multi-function button on the steering wheel. Then there are two displays on the center console. The upper one changes angle, so if you're not keen on tablets protruding from the dashboard, you can set it to align with the console, even if you won't see much. On this screen, there is information about multimedia, phone, satnav, camera view, ambient light settings, and so on. We'll get to the camera view later. For years, JLR has peddled infotainment systems so slow you'd arrive at your destination before actually inputting it in the satnav. The new system is unbelievably fast and fluid. It predicts the address even if you make a mistake. It took a while, but JLR is now as good or maybe even better than the competition. And then we have the third display, which is for the AC, seat massage, drive modes, and even more settings. Perhaps it would make more sense to have all the settings in one place, but this is not bad. From my perspective, there are much less intuitive systems than this one. This actually is quite good, even if I have to keep wiping fingerprints off it all the time. Interestingly, when I want to change drive mode, for example, I can do it with the left AC knob. Pretty cool. Interior quality is top-notch, otherwise we have average storage, cup holders, place for bits and bobs. It's a practically laid out cockpit, except for the starter button, which is perfectly covered by the steering wheel. On the road, Range Rover Velar is sufficiently fast, comfortable and very quiet indeed, even at high speed. This is the 300 horsepower V6 diesel version. Even on the outside, it's hard to tell, it's a diesel. And from the inside, you can only tell by the rev counter. And that's basically it. In sport mode, you can configure your preferred engine, gearbox, steering, suspension, whatever settings. And Velar really shifts. But don't forget, you're driving a two-ton SUV and it's not a Porsche Cayenne.
You can choose between two and three liter engines, petrol or diesel. Theoretically, a 250 horsepower four-cylinder petrol should do the job, but I think it's tad small for a big SUV like this. On the other hand, the 3-liter petrol V6 doesn't sound good at all, and it uses a lot of fuel. For the V6 diesel, JLR promises 6.5 liters per 100 kilometers combined, but in real life, it's more like 10 or 11. And most of the time, I drove in eco mode. If I were to complain about something, it's the low sitting position. Not low within the car, because I'm sitting like on a chair, but low in general. Like I said earlier, Velar is not a very high car, and driving it, I don't feel like I'm driving a Range Rover. At least not on tarmac. Because when Velar goes off-road, and I turn on one of the off-road modes and increase ground clearance, then we have a different beast. All of a sudden, it turns out the Velar is a true Range Rover, which can drive up places where a few cars I tested managed to reach. Intelligent all-wheel drive is finally intelligent, and off-road cameras make it easy to orientate in off-road situations. This is going to be a really brief test drive, but I have nothing else to say about how Velar drives. I get in, I steer, I drive, I get out. This car makes a good case for autonomous driving. It's somewhat less modern here in the back. First edition doesn't get four zone climate control, not even as an option. Fortunately, there is a 12 volt socket and two USB charging points. Side seats are heated. There are also Isofix mounts on these side seats. Now there is a large panoramic roof. This one opens. There is also an option to get a panoramic roof, which doesn't open. Kids will probably like it. Adults on the other hand will probably like electrically reclining back seats. Oh yes, that's very nice. These back seats split 40-60 if you want to carry something larger in the boot. Headroom, pretty good. Legroom, for this big a car, I'd say it's average. The boot is somewhat disappointing, not because it's small. JLR claims it's 673 liters, but according to my calculations, it's more like 550, 600 because of the mini spare under the boot floor, but that's not a problem. I don't like the cheap boot cover, wide loading lip, which on top of everything is made of scratchy plastic, and it's best if you fold the seats from the second row. I also couldn't find hands-free boot opening, not even as an option. Range Rover Velar prices start at around 56,000 euro for the base car with a 2 liter 180 horsepower diesel, but I suspect people will opt for 240 horsepower 300 horsepower diesels and spec cars for around 100,000 euro. Many items on the price list remain an option regardless of the trim. This test example is a first edition 300 horsepower diesel for around 120,000 euro. Range Rover Velar really surprised me. It turned out to be a comfortable travel companion with above average off-road abilities and exceptionally good infotainment. This is the first JLR product I would choose over a BMW any day. And how do you like Range Rover Velar? Let me know in the comment section below. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and if you really like what I do, help me on Patreon or PayPal. Links below. New episodes every Friday. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. I finished filming my Range Rover Velar review, however, there is one thing I want to bring to your attention and that's to do with the infotainment system, which I praised so much. It crashed on me a couple of times during filming today. So these two screens, they went blank, for example, and I had to restart the car to, I guess, reboot the system. And then 
there is the display in front of the driver. Uh, there is the sort of trip computer with your um, kilometers, with your average fuel consumption that would reset itself a couple of times today. I suspect it has to do with the fact that I turned the car on and off a lot of times during filming to get the right shots. And while doing so, I may have inadvertently not allowed this system to boot completely. I guess it's a complicated computer which needs to boot completely and I didn't allow it to do that. However, it's something I want to bring to your attention. It does happen. Uh, perhaps it's something Range Rover can fix with, uh, with a software update. Perhaps it's something I'm not supposed to do, as in switch the car on and off numerous times without letting it boot properly. Anyway, I still think this is a pretty good infotainment system probably the best in the business at the moment and um, yeah it just crashes randomly 